And good morning. It's a joy to welcome you into worship this morning, our third service of worship here at First United Methodist Church. My name is Scott Taylor, and I'm the director of music and worship arts and a variety of other things that seem to happen from week to week. It's important when we come into this space together that we leave some of those distractions that we might bring in with our lives, that we take a moment to just say, we're here now. And that's what this opening time is about, a chance for us to perhaps close our eyes, perhaps just be silent or still. I like how one person put it to me one week. They said, you know, I think that moment before um, the first hymn, when the organist is playing that prelude, might be the only moment of stillness I find in my life. And it's for that little moment that I keep coming back. So let's all take that moment today. Our guest organist, John Crawley, is here. The handbells are with us today. Um, we have a wonderful service of worship um, prepared for the Holy Spirit to work through today. But let's just prepare ourselves for the working of that Spirit.
Please stand as you are able and let's join together in the call to worship. Christ is the world's light, Christ and none other. Let our worship reflect that light. Let our lives reflect that light. Good morning again and welcome to First Night Methodist Church. I am Becky Brown, the associate pastor here. Uh, delighted to have you in worship. If you're visiting, we would love um, for you to check out our welcome center in the back. There will be a gift for you, a little coffee mug. Um, the ushers are coming with red pads and within them is information 
um, where you could write your information. If you're a visitor or if you're a regular attender or if you're a church member, um, please do sign in. We'd love to connect with you. If you have your children with you in worship today, we welcome them. We welcome children all the time. And uh, we also welcome small noises and loud ones. And as Keith, the senior pastor, like to say, rolling in the aisles, you know, it happens. And we just want you to know that um, I know it might frustrate you or make you stressed, but we want you to know that your children are welcome in our worship services. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that Keith Terman, our senior pastor, is away. He just got back from Pittsburgh with the high school mission trip and is headed to the beach with his family. So I will be delivering the message today. And then next week, lay speaker Scott Taylor will be delivering our message. Uh, so we look forward to hearing him <laughs> next week. Um, also today, we have a special guest who's gonna come and, and tell us about her faith. We have several interns that have been working so hard all summer long, and it is a joy for us to get to know them a little better and hear about their story. And um, Hannah Liddy is not the one who is speaking today. Um, this is Olivia Johnson, and so she is going to share with us, and we're excited to hear what she has to say. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, I'm Olivia Johnson, and I've had the pleasure of being a summer intern here. And... Uh, I just finished my first year at NC State University where I'm studying chemical engineering. And um, I, I have been, I've grown up in this church. Um, I started in the preschool and I went to the Sunday school and I was in all the Sunday school classes and I went on to youth and I was at Sunday nights youth and on the mission trips. And I was just always, I always felt at home here and safe like um, and I called First Methodist, you know, a second home to me. And um, so when I got the opportunity to come back and intern here this summer, I was very excited. Um, in June, the first big thing I had to do as an intern was go on Wilderness Trail with the youth. So I climbed in a church van and I rode up to Virginia and I had my hiking boots packed and extra socks, but I still felt I wasn't exactly ready to be an adult or an intern on a high school or a youth trip. Um, I was nervous. I would be too young to be like respected or listened to and too old to be fun. And you know, like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't sure what the trip would bring. Uh, but whenever I got there, I realized I didn't have much to worry about because I was still surrounded by the same church family who had loved and cared for me all throughout my life into high school and the first year of college too. Um, the adults, the other adults on the trip were joking and laughing about their old um, trail experiences and I realized I did not have to be so serious or hard on myself. I could relax. Um, I joined my hiking group and I started to get to know the kids I'd be with that week and uh, once we were on the trail we were laughing and joking and um, making riddles and doing all the trail stuff that you do when you're in the woods for four days. And, um, when it came to the youth, I also realized my church family was there, and I was in a safe place once again. Um, and this whole summer has just taught me so much about our church. I've learned about what goes on behind the scenes and just about all the logistics and all the people who pour so much into the everyday ministries that go on and all the members that just build it up and um, make this church go. Um, so I've been really thankful to see that and to see that part of this church. Um, I'm thankful for a church that has encouraged me to go out and um, be an intern and take on things I normally would, probably wouldn't have. And um, I'm very grateful for having a church that loves me past my high school years and on to college and accepted me to work here this summer. So thank you.
Will you please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel? Our gospel lesson today is from Luke chapter 10, beginning with the 25th verse. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hand of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he, sent, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I can't help but think of Mr. Rogers, you know, Mr. Fred Rogers, when I hear the question, who is my neighbor? I grew up on the show, Mr. Rogers, in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. It was like watching an entire episode on television of the best illustrated children's sermon that there ever was by this beautiful and sweet and kind and precious Presbyterian minister who, all, who lived in a land of imagination, with puppets, with special guests, and went on field trips. <laughs> so I learned so much from watching Mr. Rogers, especially that neighbors sometimes look different than you do or than you expect, and everyone is welcomed and included in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Because the song says, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor, would you be mine? Could you be mine? And then it ends, won't you be my neighbor? I was hoping more people would sing with me, but it's okay. <laughs> but I love, I love that Mr. Rogers, and, I, and you know, just as the same familiarity I have for that television show and for him as a person, I have the same familiarity for our passage today, the parable of the Good Samaritan. You see, I've heard so many sermons on the Good Samaritan growing up. And you may have two, and you get to hear one more today. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, but, you know, th this must have been a favorite passage for my preachers growing up, um, because they preached on it all the time. And I heard about it all the time in Sunday school. I heard about it, you know, in uh, vacation Bible school. And so it was one of those passages in the, in the Bible that just continued to ring over and over in my mind. And it still does as an adult. It's been firmly cemented into who I am. And so as a part of the story, you know, the priest and the Levite, they walk by the man in the ditch and they do nothing. They, they don't do anything for him. And so I don't want to be like them. 
There are many of times that I am guilty of walking away, of passing by, of seeing a need and not doing anything about it. But as a part of who I am, I, I live by the Good Samaritan. I want to be like him. You know, I want to stop. I never want to pass by. I always want to take the time to see the person in need, to spend time with them, to, to make sure that they, I'm hearing what they're saying. And because of that, it means that I'm often late. This is my excuse, at least. I'm often late to meetings with people, or I'm often um, late to, to see somebody because you know, I've, I've, been t- I've lingered in another conversation with someone who is hurting um, or who needed some emotional or spiritual support, and you know, I'm, I'm willing to take that extra time because within my heart, I don't want to be the one who passes by. So our story today begins with a lawyer asking questions of Jesus. He was an expert in the law of Moses. He knew Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy all by heart, word for word, memorized every single word. He internalized the law and was an expert, and so people would come and ask him questions when they wanted to know what does it say in the law he would help them. So earlier in the chapter of Luke, chapter 10, if we begin at the beginning of the chapter, we hear of the Lord appointing 70 people to go out in pairs to spread the good news that the kingdom of God has come near. And so 70, pair, 70 people would go in pairs to nearby villages to be sent out to tell people about Jesus, to tell people that Jesus was coming, to kind of prime them for the arrival of Jesus' teachings. They were casting out demons. They said lots of demons were cast out. They were also um, healing people, you know, doing the work and ministry of Jesus. So they come back to Jesus, the report, and they're on a spiritual high. They've done such amazing things. Things have happened. They've seen so many demons cast out, and I'm thinking to myself, that seems frightening. You know, what does that look like? Um, so they, you know, they had had this experience, and they shared it with Jesus, and Jesus commended them and said, great job, thank you. And he says to them, you know, look, I, because you have done these things, your names are written in heaven. So immediately following the statement, the lawyer stood up to test Jesus or to ask Jesus the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So I assume, and we can assume, that since there's no transition in the stories from the 70 who had gone out in ministry and mission to the lawyer standing up, I mean, there isn't a, and then along the way, Jesus met a lawyer, no, it just continues in that stream that the lawyer was one of the 70 Well, it makes complete sense. Who else would you send out? He knew the scripture backwards and forwards. He understood the law. He was a good teacher. He knew it. He wanted wanted to be good. And so he had just been in ministry, just seen miraculous things, and comes back and gets hung up on this eternal life question. What do you mean my name is written in heaven? How do I inherit that? So Jesus, in true rabbinic tradition, says, answers his question with with a question, hoping for him to answer his own question himself. And so he says to him, what is written in the law? What do you read? And so the lawyer responds quickly with the correct answer, quotes Deuteronomy 6, and then tags on a little bit from Leviticus chapter 19, just to kind of show Jesus, yeah, I know what I'm talking about. I can even pull up this obscure, maybe, text from Leviticus too. And so Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9 says this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So in Jewish liturgy, this is the lead paragraph into the Shema, which means hearing or hear in Hebrew. So the faithful are instructed to recite this twice a day and faithful Jews still do this twice a day and tell their children and they know the Shema. 
Then the lawyer tags on the bit about loving neighbors, and that comes right out of Leviticus 19, 17 and 18. It says, you shall not hate in your heart any one of your own kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So in Leviticus, these were commands given to Moses by God shortly after the Ten Commandments. And these were instructions made in this format of the Ten Commandments for the people of Israel, a way to live holy lives as God is holy. Then Jesus essentially responds to the lawyer, bam, you nailed it, great job, now just go and do that. You know, boy. here's your extra credit, you got the answer correct. And then the lawyer couldn't leave it. He added a clarifying question again. He says, and who is my neighbor, Jesus? He really should have just asked what he was thinking, which probably was, who isn't my neighbor? Who is the person that I don't have to love, don't have to bother with, the person that is really not worth my time? What do I have to do the minimum, maybe, to make sure that I achieve eternal life? And because Jesus picks up on what he really means, he responds with a parable. So a man was going down a windy road, and this windy, dangerous road was steep, and it had high elevation changes from Jerusalem all the way down below sea level to Jericho. And it was widely known among everyone at the time, and is still a dangerous road today, that this windy cliff road had plenty of places for people to hide. It was known as being a bloody road. It was not one that you would go um, take lightly. It was definitely not one that you would travel alone without a caravan. It was dangerous. People were robbed, mugged all the time. And so it tells about this, this man who was attacked, beaten, stripped naked, and left for dead in the ditch. So there are three people who come upon this poor man. Two of them see him and walk by, and the third chooses to act mercifully. So this storytelling style was familiar to those listening to the parable. So it was a familiar grouping of three. They'd heard it stories like this before. The first one, eh, the second one, nope, and then the third one, hooray, they got it, you know. And in their, in their time, those grouping of three would have been the priest, the Levite, and then the Israelite, or themselves. And you can imagine their surprise when Jesus says, and a Samaritan, and they go, ah, what? You know, twisted, twisted the story. Because you see, the Samaritan was the enemy. The hearers of the story may, would never be caught calling the most reviled, most heretical, most hated and begrudged Samaritan good. It would be like using this analogy. So Harry and Ron were walking. They didn't stop. If you like to read Harry Potter, you know. Harry and Ron walked by. And then, you know, they didn't do anything. And then Voldemort stopped to help the guy in the ditch, you know. <laughs> like leaving Hermione out of the picture. Of course, she would have stopped, right? She helps everybody. No. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the idea. Is this person that epitomizes hate and evil is the hero. The Samaritans were despised, especially by the Jews. And they were regarded as unclean. They defiled marriage by intermarrying with other ethnicities, major no-no. They disagreed with where the very temple of God should be. They interpreted the Hebrew scriptures differently, and the Jewish people would say, wrong. They had a history of attacking and oppressing the Jewish people. I mean, you open your Bible and Ezra and Nehemiah and 2 Chronicles talks all about the Samaritans and how horrible they are and how many terrible things they did um, to oppress the Israelites. So this would be the last type of person that the hearers of Jesus' parable would expect that would actually stop and help someone. And if they imagined themselves in the story as the man in the ditch, then they probably would say, I would rather die than let a Samaritan help me. Just leave me. Someone else surely will come. Yet the Samaritan was moved to compassion. 
And in the Greek word, move to compassion or move to pity, is this word for this gut-wrenching kind of feeling, this little churning in your gut. You know that feeling you have when you just have that actual physical response and you feel like you have to do something. You have to move, you're moved to compassion. So this is what the Samaritan felt. He saw the man, he knelt down, bandaged his wounds, took him to a hotel, continued to care for him, stayed with him overnight, paid for him um, for his health care and his lodging, left more money to, to cover future expenses, and said, oh, by the way, when I, come, when I come back, I'll check on him and see if I owe you more. The enemy did this. The reviled, the heartless, and despised other. And then we look at the parable years later and have the audacity to call the Samaritan good. So this leads me to the question, why did the faithful ones, the priest and the Levite or the devoted church worker or lay leader in the church, notice the horribly injured man and walk by, cross the road, go out of their way to walk by? You know, you can find almost anything on YouTube. <laughs> and I found a, a sermon by Martin Luther King Jr., a recording, an audio recording of one of his sermons and on the Good Samaritan. And so he said this. I'm going to tell you what my imagination tells me. It's possible these men were afraid. And so the first question that the priest and Levi asked was, if I stop and help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan came by and reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? How many times do we let our own fear get the better of us? How many times are we afraid and do not respond because we think about our own self-preservation first. So after the parable is finished, Jesus asked the liar, so which of these three was the neighbor to the man who was in the ditch, who, was in, who fell to the hand of the robbers? And so the lawyer answers again correctly by saying, the one who showed him mercy. It's as if he couldn't even get the words out to say, the Samaritan. You know, he had to call him the one who showed mercy. So I couldn't even, even think about that. The lawyer had all the right answers to Jesus' questions. He knew the scriptures backwards and forwards, yet he didn't seem to know the very heart of God. The very nature of his question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's all about him. It's all about his individual salvation. He wants to know so that he can make sure that he can add that on his to-do list of how to get saved, you know, help the neighbor. He wants to understand so that he knows his salvation is secure. He knows the answer. Love God, love neighbor. He just assumes that the neighbor means someone who looks like him, who thinks like him, who believes like him, who reads the Bible just like him, and who worships God just like him. How could this neighbor possibly be proven to be an enemy? The liar could have easily been asking Jesus, what's the point to the life of God? Because you can think about salvation and, or eternal life in that way. What does it mean? To, what's the point of having life with God? And Jesus asked him to look within the law for the answer. Jesus doesn't say, ah, oh, just throw out the law. It doesn't matter. I'm here. I will tell you what really is, is about faith and how to live. Forget about all that old stuff. It's irrelevant. No. Jesus says, what do you read? What do you find? What is the, at the very heart of faith together? So Jesus makes the point that the way of life with God is the way of mercy, compassion, and love. And all of these are found within the law. 
Therefore, the reason that we should love our neighbor, the alien, the stranger, our enemies, is because of God. Not because God says so, or because we will feel guilty if we don't do what God says, or because we're worried about our salvation if we don't, but because God loves them. God wants our love to be more than knowing all the right answers, than knowing the right way to love. God wants our love to also be an action. Amy Jill Levine says in her book about some of the parables called short stories by Jesus, and she says, for the lawyer and for Luke's readers, the Samaritan does what God does. The divine is manifested only through our actions. Therefore, Jesus responds to the lawyer's observation, not with a question and not with a parable, but with an imperative. Go, he says, and you do likewise. To speak of, a loving, God, of loving God and loving neighbor does not require theological precision. It does not ask for a particular location of worship. It does not speak to a particular book or of the scriptures. Loving God and loving neighbor cannot exist in the abstract. They need to be enacted. So, yes, at the end of the day, none of us want to be like those who pass by. We don't want to be like the priest or the Levite, who apparently had great excuses as to why they didn't need to stop by and help the seriously wounded man. We want to have love for our neighbors, every one of them, and to be moved with action to action when we see pain. And yes, sometimes God surprises us, surprises us with the answers that we are seeking, even when we have studied our Bibles and have lived our lives dedicated to following our faith. God still surprises us with those who seem to know and understand the heart of God and may provide the example of how we should live our life for God. to bring it around to Mr. Rogers. He's famous for saying this. We live in a world in which we need to share responsibility. It's easy to say, it's not my child, not my community, not my world, not my problem. Then there are those who see the need and respond. I consider those people my heroes. So may we go and do likewise loving God with our heart, our soul, our strength, and mind, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. Amen.
ahead. Please be seated. There are many ways that I see the city of God being brought forth at this church week in and week out. Even in the summer, when you might think calendars slow down, in many ways it's one of the liveliest times. We have our food pantry open on Saturdays with showers being offered to the community, people able to come and get food with no prerequisite. It's a wonderful thing to see. We have education programs for children going on in the middle of the week like Wacky Worship Wednesday. I think I got that right. Alliteration was never my, uh, my strong suit. <laughs> This week at Wacky Worship Wednesday, I had the joy of trying to explain the story of the Good Samaritan to three-year-olds. It really helps you just, you know, uh, trim, uh, trim that down into its, into its really core message. Um, but it's a wonderful thing to be drawing people from the community, talking about these stories of Christ, and learning what it means to be the body of Christ together. There's many things going on in the life of our church. As always, there's concerts in the summer. It seems like there's so many concerts. Um, secretly, my favorite concert of the summer just happened this past week, which is the harp concert, when I get to close my eyes and listen to who I think is the best harpist in the world, and it just is, it feeds me for the entire year. But we have amazing concerts still to come. This afternoon is the final installment of the Carolina Chamber Music Society. I was told by John, he was at their program last night at Warren Wilson, that it's a fabulous uh, program today with an octet of strings and so we look forward to all that that program means. It is a ticketed event and the tickets are $20 and I will meet you after the program, after the service rather, in the Narthex if you would like to get a ticket. I can give you those tickets for $20. There's 25 at the door so save a little bit of money with me. Um, also tomorrow we have a special treat. Anna Tebow was not able to be here this morning. I wish she could have been um, because she knows so much more about this than I do but Anna Tebow is uh, one of the master musicians who go to this church. She's a flute player. She's played all over the world. And she has a friend of hers coming in tomorrow night for one night and one night only. Um, Robert Dick is one of the world's leading inventors and innovators of the flute. And he's going to do a full program with nothing but his flute. There's no accompaniment. It's just... Um, just he and his instrument, and he's going to be showing some of the inventions that he's brought into the world of flute, including uh, a new glissando technique, and I'm told that he's just a remarkable person to see. He is described uh, by others, thankfully, I think, as the Jimi Hendrix of music. No, as the Jimi Hendrix of the flute. The Jimi Hendrix of music is Jimi Hendrix, obviously. <clears throat> we look forward to to see in what, what he brings. I know it's going to be an amazing concert, and if Anna Tebow says he's one of her favorite flutists, I definitely want to see this, this guy. Later on in the week, on Friday, we um, host our annual concert with the late Junaluska Singers. We heard them here in worship about a month and a half ago, and that was a wonderful experience. You know, we miss Kathy here in the summers a little bit because Kathy works over at the lake helping with their worship services. But I know the thing that Kathy is most excited about in her summers is being able to work with these young uh, college students. She takes it very seriously, uh, the role of being a mentor to them. We always talk about how amazing the late Junaleska singers are. Um, they are so because of people like Kathy who consider this, quite honestly, part of her ministry. Um, so we look forward to welcoming the late Junaluska singers here on Friday, and we look forward to welcoming Kathy back with us on Friday as well. So that program's at 7. It's a free concert. It's always a wonderful experience to hear the, the, the singers in this room and to just build that family tighter. And that's why I really want to invite everyone, invite everyone you know, let's fill the place up, bring people, if they've never heard the singers, if they've heard them a thousand times, let's bring everyone into this room on Friday night to build this community stronger around music. All right, so those are most of my announcements. There's a few others. Um, uh, in two weeks, there's a lunch and learn opportunity that you can sign up for in the bulletin. And we also have a Rise Against Hunger event right around the corner on August 11th. And I just encourage you to read all the announcements that are in your bulletin. Stay in touch with all the many things this church is doing. And now let us turn our hearts, our minds to prayer. 
We want to remember today all those listed in our prayer concerns on the back of the bulletin, those recovering at home. I want to specifically uh, mention that um, we keep Brenda Griswold in our prayer. She's uh, had a difficult week, but she's back at home after a short stay in the hospital. I saw John. He's on our um, usher crew today. So our prayers go to, to you, John, and to Brenda. We, um, we, we send our prayers for healing home with you today. We want to remember the family of Shirley Robinson. Shirley was a member of the Chancel Choir, a dear friend of ours. She passed away this week. Her service will be today at Wells Funeral Home. Reverend Brown will be officiating. Um, it's at 2.30 at the chapel at Wells Funeral Home. And we certainly remember her daughter and Trader today as well as they are grieving. And finally, um, Nicole Sumter is, uh, sits in our front office, um, helps us with the bulletins. In fact, it's been... Um, very difficult in her absence to, to just keep the bulletins printing in many ways. And I am uh, sad to inform you that her father, Roy, passed away earlier this week um, after a long battle with liver disease. So um, please keep Nicole and her mother, Sheila, in your prayers um, as they've lost a father and, and lost a dear husband. Let us go to God in prayer. God of these age-weathered mountains, God of daffodils, we come this morning with a song of rejoicing for all the dappled things you've brought to life. For who can lift their eyes to the mountains and not find you there? Who can taste the sweetness of summer fruit and not savor you? Who can smell the fresh-cut grass? and not be swept into your fragrance? Who can hear the singer and see the dancer and not be compelled by your always creating spirit? Who can live in this world and not be grateful? Surely we are grateful. And yet we know that we do not fully see all that you have done we do not fully understand. We see as through a dirty mirror just a reflection of your glory. How much of your beauty do we miss in our haste to live fast lives? How much of you do we not see because of self-imposed distractions? How many of your dear children escape our attention? Whether we drive down the street or open a newspaper, we are confronted with folks who have been robbed and beaten and stripped and left to, the die, left to die on the side of some road. Give us the courage to look down on the side of that road and give us compassion for whoever we find there. People who have hiked thousands of miles through deserts to escape fear and hatred, only to be met at a border with more fear, more hatred. Help us see them. People who are victims of addiction and just need someone willing to get in the ditch with them, help us see them too. People, people who need food, people who need clothes, people who need a shower, people who need another chance. Let us see them, Lord. Let us be moved by them. And let us move toward them. Finally, we give you thanks for those times when we have found ourselves in that ditch, beaten and robbed, and left to die. We thank you for sending us good Samaritans who don't ask questions, who don't judge us, who don't preach to us, who simply look at us and say, I've been here before and I know the way out. Take my hand. And in that spirit, we lift our prayers to you for all those recovering from illness and especially Brenda. And we pray for the repose of the souls of Shirley Robinson and 
and Roy Sumner. And we pray for the peace that their families <coughs> so need in this moment of grief. And we bring you the prayers of our hearts. We know the problems of this world are great, but inspire us once again with such a faith to meet these problems head on. Inspire in us such audacity that we can say, these problems may be great, but we know the Church of Christ. We know the living body alive in this world, and we know that it is more than equal to the task at hand. We ask all of this in the name of Christ, who taught us, his disciples, to pray boldly. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All good things around us are sent from heaven above. So thank the Lord for all his love. Let us give back to God a portion of that which we have been so richly blessed.
Gracious God, we give you great thanks for those moments in our lives in which you have found us in a ditch, ditch and helped us out. We pray that these gifts brought to your altar might be used for those in this world, in this community, who need to know your love, your mercy, and your care. And we meet, may we commit ourselves as your offerings to be vessels of such in this world. In the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. So now let us go together into the world to go and love God and love neighbor. May we, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go and do likewise.